Well, good morning, everybody, and happy almost New Year, right? It is here, new decade and everything. It's coming, it's coming just a few days away. Um, and, you know, I know, let's just ask this. How many of you here have ever made a New Year's resolution? How many of you have ever, ever failed with that New Year's resolution? All right, good. Okay, so we're all together on that. And I know that that's coming up, right? Whether you do it or not do it, I mean, this time of the year, we think a lot about changes, what should change in the new year and resolutions? And I did a little bit of research on the history of New Year's resolutions. Uh, and this is what I found out, that the practice actually began thousands of years ago with, with the Babylonian and the Roman empires. They actually did that back thousands of years ago. And they would take a look at the, the last year of their life, look at all the things that had gone wrong that they messed up on, and then they would purposefully go to their gods and make sacrifices and everything in order to sacrifice to their God to make a promise to do better in that area in the next year. Now, I think, lucky for us, it's a little bit different today because when we make promises, really, we're not, a lot of times we're not making promises. Sometimes they are to God. Most of the time, we're making promises to ourselves, right? Which is probably why about only 8% of us will actually keep that New Year's resolution that we make. That's what the, the statistics show us. Um, it's a struggle to keep those. And you guys know some of the top New Year's resolutions, right? Somebody just yell out to me, what do you think are the top New Year's resolutions that are out there going around right now? Weight loss, yep. What else? No smoking, right? Quit a bad habit, yep. What else? Financial, save more money, yeah. What's that? Exercise, that's right. Gotta get in better shape for sure, right? I mean, Right there, that's the, that's the top ones that we hear every year that most of us have probably done. Sometimes it's learn something new, right? A new language, a new skill set, something like that. Those are the things that are the top. And we make them all. And, and at some time or another, as we saw, all of us in here probably made a New Year's resolution. Some have gone well. Most probably have not gone as well. We probably failed or, or mistakenly tried to do something we were not ready to do. I don't know, right? And... But some of us, I think, are, as we're looking to this new season, this new year, we're looking at a new season of our life. I, I, so I look at the last year of my family's life. We are at a completely different place, a different season today than we were this time last year. Because last year in our lives, um, we, had a, we had a daughter that was a senior in college and just, had just gotten engaged to be married we had uh, a, a middle daughter that, that's actually working out in Delta, Colorado and doing a great thing working with special needs kids. I have a youngest daughter who was a senior in high school. Karen and I, my wife and I were serving at a church in Colorado Springs where we had been around that church for about 15 years serving at that church. And now a year later, it's all changed. My, my daughter has graduated from college and has now been married for a few months now. My, my youngest daughter has graduated from high school. Karen and I moved back to Odessa, Texas, where we had been for years before, to come back and minister again here to a community that, that we love. But none of this was stuff that we actually saw a year, 14 months ago. We didn't see that. And a lot of you can look back at the last year of your life and the place you are today is not the same as it was then. Things have changed. Seasons of life has affected what's gonna go forward in your next seasons of life. And here's the thing, none of us really know what's about to happen in this new year. We don't know. And so I'm gonna give just three things today that I think can help all of us as we look to the new year and look to the actual, the seasons of life that are gonna come, whether we like it or not, in the next year. Seasons are gonna change. And so I'm gonna give us just kind of three things that kind of help us, I think, to prepare for those things and to be looking for those things. The first one is this. Be careful not to miss your season. Just be careful not to miss the season that's coming up. We get so busy and so many things going on, sometimes we miss what God has set out in front of us. How many of you guys have ever played baseball or softball in your lives? Anybody? Let me see the hands. Okay. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some baseball and softball analogy here. So, hey, could you help me out right here? Can you give me these things from the front row? I jumped down, but I might break something of my body here. All right, thank you very much. All right, so a lot of us have played, some of us have not, but as I look back at my sports career, when I was in, in high school and junior high and stuff, my biggest sports were soccer and basketball. That's the two sports that I played most. Um, and I never really played much baseball, never played any baseball. Well, my senior year, 
of high school. I finished uh, basketball season, and usually at the end of basketball season, there would always be something more basketball or soccer oriented to do, some other league type stuff or just training, that kind of thing. And so I would never play baseball. But my senior year, I finished, base, I finished basketball season, and I had some freedom. I didn't have anything going on, so I decided I would try out for our baseball team at our high school. Now our high school is a small school, a uh, small Christian private school. And, and so the coaches that were the coaches of the baseball team were also coaches that I had in basketball and soccer. They, they've been trying to get me to play baseball for years. So I decided I'd try out for the team. Wasn't much of a tryout. I made the team because they needed bodies, really. And, and they knew my athleticism. They knew my speed and stuff. They, they, th- they knew I could be a help to the team. So I made the team. We spent the weeks practicing to get ready for the season. I was learning my skills. I mean, I had played catch and stuff, of course, um, but I decided that now was the time to really kind of step it up, and I was really enjoying it. I felt like I was doing good, um, and then they put me um, starting in center field because I was, I was fast, and so I could get to the balls, and, and realized if you're a baseball player, the bat, and my illustrations are softball stuff. Give me a break. I, I didn't have baseball in my gear. Okay, so don't, don't hold that to me. All right, so with the first game of the year, um, we're playing, we've been practicing at our school. We didn't really have a baseball field, more of a softball field size of a field. Um, so our first game, we went to this college stadium to play our first game. And it's a huge, it's a huge place. And it's, center field is the biggest I've ever seen it, right? As far as the field, the fence and everything else. And so we're, we're you know, shagging flies and doing everything we can to get ready for the game. Well, the first, the first inning comes up and, and it's, it's not bad. There's, a, there's one out, a guy's gotten on base, and the guy gets up and he hits a fly ball to me in center field. Now, I've been coached that if you're gonna be in center field, don't ever, you know, you gotta take a couple steps back and then look where the ball is so if you can come forward, right? Because you don't wanna try to catch balls over your head. You wanna be able to come forward to get the balls. Um, so I did that. I came out and I looked and the ball was coming and it was a, it was a fly ball. But I, I did the one thing you're not supposed to do. What's one thing you should probably never do when you're about to catch a ball? Take, well, close your eyes. That would be bad. Yes. I didn't close my eyes, but I did take my eye off the ball. That was not a good thing either. And so I'm looking, and as I take my step back, I'm coming to the ball, and the ball comes over the glove, because I took my eye off, and hits me where? Smack dab in the middle of the forehead. I mean, it hits me right in the forehead. And luckily, I have a huge head. Um, and so the ball didn't ricochet to the right or the left, but it did knock me to the ground. Immediately, it cut my head and had blood, and, and the ball ricocheted. But the guy in first had been watching me to right to tag up. That was his plan. Well, the second baseman had come out to be my relay guy. The ball bounced directly to the second baseman coming out to me, who picked it up and turned around, and he threw the guy out of second base. Assist for Randy. That's what I take, that's what I take for that. Now, it was not pretty, and my friends who loved me so much laughed at me as I was out there. We still had to finish that inning. So we get the out, we get the next outs, and we get up to bat. Well, because I'm one of the fastest guys on the team, I'm also the leadoff hitter. Now, here's the problem. I've now got a cut in my head, and I've got blood in my eyes. This is before all the years of the concussion protocol stuff. I'm sure I had a concussion, but it didn't matter. I just put some dirt on it, right? That's what you're supposed to do to play. And so I did. I got ready, and I get up to bat, and I, and I took some big swings up to bat. And I took some, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can remember everything. I may have been a bit dizzy at the time, but I swung, and I swung hard at those balls. And I didn't, and I didn't hit the first couple. I, I whiffed several times, okay? Fouled off, not several times, because you can't whiff more than three times, right? So I whiffed twice, I fouled off a couple, and then luckily, I made connection with the ball. And it was a good enough connection with the ball that it actually gapped the left fielder and the center fielder, and it rolled through them towards the fence, to the fence. Because I was fast enough, I actually had gotten around the bases pretty quick that I actually ended up, long story short, with an in-the-park home run. So my only home run in my whole year, baseball, in the park home run, because I was able to outrun the ball. Now, I'm not sure if the blood and the cut and everything helped me or hurt me the rest of that year, because I don't remember anything else about that year but that one thing right there, right? But that's what it was. And, and I had some success, but I whiffed a lot as well. And we all whiff at things, right? There's a lot of times we miss completely. We get up to the bat, we get up to the plate of life, and we swing hard, and we miss. And my bat's rolling away. And we miss, right? And, it's, and, it, and sometimes we do that. And we gotta be careful when we come into this new year to not miss whatever season God has in store for us. Because a lot of times we'll do that. We'll miss what God has in store. Because here's the thing, here's what I wanna tell you this morning. The opportunity of a lifetime 
is only good for the lifetime of the opportunity. And a lot of times we don't get that. The opportunity of a lifetime is only good for the lifetime of an opportunity. We may see a big opportunity, but we get a little bit nervous, a little bit scared about what might be involved in that. And so we back away and we miss it completely. And it's only good for that short amount of time and then it's gone. And there's some, and there's some illustrations in scripture that kind of help prove this, I think. We can see some, some people in scripture that, this, that they did this. The Jewish people did it. They did it a couple times. In fact, we're gonna actually go to the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 14. Um, if you, have the, you, you can open to that right now. We're gonna get to that, that passage in a second. If you want a Bible around you that's in, in one of the chair seats, it's, a, it's page 127. Um, and, and we're gonna look, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a history, a little bit of detail, background behind what we're about to read. So after hundreds of years, the Israelite people who had been enslaved in, 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 in Egypt, Right, We know the story, the prince of Egypt and all that stuff. They were enslaved for hundreds of years and then God has Moses come and deliver them from slavery. Had the 10 plagues and all the things that went on to get them out of Egypt, out of slavery to go to the promised land. The land God had prepared just for them, just for the Israelite people. This was the next season for them to go into the promised land. And so they get to this, to the land and they, and they do what? They send in 12 spies. We've probably heard the story. We talked about Caleb even a few months ago, but they send in 12 spies to check out the land, to see what it was gonna take to move into the promised land, to do what God had planned for them. But 10 of the guys come back and say, we can't do it. Two of the guys come back and say, we should do it right now. Let's go. God's on our side. We can do this. But 10 of them came back and said, no, no, no. There's no way we can do this. Their armies are too big. They're, they're too strong. Their soldiers are literally giants. If we try to do this, if we attempt to do what God has told us to do, at this time when he's told us to do it, we're gonna get wiped out. They had an opportunity of a lifetime to move into the, the promised land right then and they missed it because the people of Israel said, there's no way. In fact, when the people of Israel heard the, the report from these 10 spies, that there was no way they were all gonna die if they tried to move in the promised land. We get to Numbers 14, and we see what they said. Numbers 14, verse one through three. It says, then the whole community, they broke into loud cries, and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron, and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and our children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us just to go back to Egypt, to go back to slavery? It'd be better if we just did that because this is impossible for us to do. They were so convinced that the next season wasn't right for them that they decided to whine, moan, and cry about it instead of taking action and moving into it. They missed, they whiffed, and they whiffed hard. So then God comes to Moses and tells him this in Numbers, in Numbers 14 and tells Moses to tell the people, verse 22, a little bit further down in the chapter there, none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these 10 times and did not obey me will ever see the land I swore to give to their fathers. None of those who have despised me will see it. His punishment for the Israelites Moving, not moving forward into this next season and instead of running from God's timing and God's opportunity was that none of them, except for those two spies and their families, were ever gonna get to go into the promised land. They whiffed, they swung and they missed. But now here, here's what happens a few, a few verses later in the same chapter, verse 39. Now when Moses reported these words to all the Israelites, the people were overcome with grief. They got up early the next morning and they went up the ridge of the hill country saying, let's go to the place that the Lord promised for we were wrong. But Moses responded, why are you going against the Lord's command? It won't succeed. Don't go because the Lord is not among you and you will be defeated by your enemies. The Amalekites and the Canaanites are right in front of you and you will fall by the sword. The Lord won't be with you since you have turned from following him. But they dared to go up the ridge of the hill country, even though the ark of the Lord's covenant and Moses did not leave the camp. 
Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that part of the hill country came down, attacked them, and routed them as far as Hormah. They missed twice. The first time they missed because they failed to step into a season when it was right for them, when they were supposed to step into that season. The second time, the exact same event they tried to do at a different season when God was not with them. They weren't supposed to be doing it then. They were supposed to have done it earlier. The exact same event on one day was right. Another day, it was wrong. They missed the opportunity. The season had changed. And the Jewish people kept doing the wrong thing at the right time or the right thing at the wrong time. We've probably all been there. They missed, they whiffed twice. King David also missed twice. If you know some of the story about King David in the Old Testament, he had some struggles doing what he was supposed to have done when he was supposed to to have done it. The first time he missed was when he was supposed to have led his armies into battle and he didn't, okay? In 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse one, it's, it's on page 364 in your Bibles, but he was supposed to be the leader of this armies, the Israelite army, going in to defeat and to fight and to, to lead his army. He was, the, he was the general. He was the soldier of all soldiers everybody looked to. But in 1 Chronicles 20, verse one, we see that he, he kind of, he decided to do something different. In the spring, it says, when kings marched out to war, Joab led the army. Not David, Joab led the army and destroyed the, the Ammonites' land. He came to Rabbah and he besieged it. But David remained in Jerusalem. Joab attacked Rabbah and he demolished it. It was in this season where he missed the opportunity to go and fight like he was supposed to and lead his armies that instead he stayed home. And when he stayed home, this is when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And if you know that whole the story, it was a mess. And it was a horrible mess because he missed the season he was supposed to be in. But then second, the time he missed it, was when he went out to battle and he should have stayed home. In 2 Samuel, verse 21, you go back a few pages uh, in, your, in your Bible, 2 Samuel 21, um, in verse 15 and 17, we see that, that he went out to war at a time where he should have been home. It says in verse 15, it says, the Philistines again waged war against Israel. David went down with his soldiers and they fought the Philistines, but David became exhausted. Then Ishbi Manab, one of the descendants of the giants, whose bronze spear weighed about eight pounds and who wore new armor, intended to kill David. But Abishai, son of Zariah, came to his aid, struck the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, you must never again go out with us to battle. You must not extinguish the lamp of Israel. David's season had changed. He was now to be a light and an inspiration to his armies, not the actual leader of his armies. He was no longer the warrior king. He was to be a light and inspiration. But he missed it. Twice he missed. And guys, missing your season can have some, some, some consequences. As David's life and the Israelites' history kind of illustrates, there can be bad consequences to missing your season. But before we move on, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, even though the Israelites did miss out on that promised land, eventually they got to go into the promised land. The kids got to go in the promised land. They took over the promised land and moved into it like they're supposed to have, done 40 years before. And then David's life is summed up in the New Testament in a whole different way than the things that we see when we start looking at his and analyzing his life and the misses that he had. Because like if you look in Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul describes David. He doesn't describe him as somebody who missed out in life, doesn't describe him as somebody who swung and missed. No, he says in Acts 13 verse 36, for David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and decayed. After serving God's purpose. He still fulfilled God's purpose for his life. Here's the thing. I want to be careful when I say this, but guys, you can miss seasons in your life and still be able to fulfill God's purpose for your life. Let me explain it using some more baseball analogy real quick. Because here's the thing, you can strike out several times in a game and still be able to win the game. Just because you struck out doesn't mean that the game is over. What does it mean? That bat is over. That's it. Some of the best hitters in baseball in the world were also some of the, most, the biggest strikeout leaders in the world. 
You go back to the late 90s, Sammy Sosa, who was a great baseball player, he had more strikeouts than anyone else in baseball in the years 1997 to 1999. But in those same three years, he was also in the top, top home run hitters of all baseball at the same time because he was swinging. In 1997, he had 36 home runs and he was number 14 on the home run leading list of baseball. In 1998, he had 66 home runs, number two in all leaders of, of home runs in baseball. 1999, 63 home runs, and he was number two in leaders of all home runs in baseball because he was swinging, but he also led in strikeouts. Didn't mean his life was over, his, his whole game was over, his career was over. No, he just kept on swinging. When he struck out, he didn't quit. He kept on going, and he hit home run after home run after home run. I'm not sure if you've ever struck out in some season of life. I bet you probably have, just as I have. And here's the thing. If you miss a season, there can be repercussions. But you can still end life with a good grade. You can still be positive. You, you don't, just don't quit. Everyone can admit, everyone in this room can admit that they probably at one time or another missed what God had planned for them in some way, shape, or form. We probably missed it. But that doesn't mean it's over. What it means is then we get to rely on God's grace that he so generously bestows upon us even in the seasons when we're missing. So it makes his grace so amazing. That's why we sing so much about it. So the first thing as we're moving into this new year and, and maybe some new seasons is be careful. Try not to miss the season God's got planned for you. Second, be careful how you label your season because it will affect how you live in your season. You see, I think too many of us get to this point. We label a season that we're in. Man, this is a horrible season. This is a bad, this is impossible. And we label it like that. And because we label it like that, then everything we do living in it makes it even more impossible because we've already labeled it as impossible. So why would we try even harder? See, here's what I believe about seasons of life. There's gonna be seasons that are gonna be hard. They're gonna be bad. They could even feel like they're impossible. But during that season, there's just gonna be impossible things happening. It's not an impossible season. And if we label it as, man, everything's impossible, then we're never gonna be able to succeed, get through that. We're gonna struggle, we're gonna be down, we're gonna be depressed, it's gonna be horrible. Where if we just realize there's some impossible things that may be happening, but that doesn't define the season. As soon as you define it is when we get ourselves into trouble. Here's what I want us to be careful of. And here's a statement, I'm gonna have it on the screen. Don't make permanent statements because of present conditions. I think many, I've done this in my life. We made a, a, permanent stage, a permanent statement, like I always mess up. Life is never gonna get better. I never get it right. I'll never find love again. I'll never be happy again. Nothing is ever gonna be, and when we make all these permanent statements about what's really, guys, just a present condition that's gonna change, right? It's gonna change. But yet we make these permanent statements about it. I don't know what you call those people in your house, but in my house, I call my daughter a drama queen when she says that kind of stuff, right? I'm not looking at you back there, Hannah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Dude, that's what we do, right? We, it's a drama, because that's what the kind of thing people are when they do that. They're just, it's just a lot of drama. And who needs the extra weight? When you're in a difficult season, why would you keep piling stuff on and making those permanent statements? No, you need somebody to help pump you up to encourage you, Right? Which is why church is so important and, and being a part of this community is so important. You know, through my years as an athlete, I've had, I've had all kinds of coaches in my, in my years. Um, and, and I've had many of those coaches who, 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 and I, who like to yell and they scream and they berate their players in order to encourage them to do better, right? That's kind of how they do it. And, and you guys have probably had coaches like that. They like to yell and they like to, to get on you and they think it's gonna make you do better. And, and instead of just maybe encouraging you and building you up, I've got to coach a lot of times over the years. And when I coach, I try not to be that kind of a coach. I would rather be able to speak words of encouragement to help build them up. Now, every once in a while, they may need that metaphorical kick in the backside to do better and I'll do that. That's not my go-to move. Now, don't ask my daughters how I coach them because I never coached them. I just yelled from the sidelines, right, at them. Um, I, I purposely didn't po coach them. I want them to still love me later on. Um, but that's the deal. Sometimes that's how it is. We just need encouragement. Man, David, we look back at the story of David, he constantly was, something was going on in his life where he kept constantly finding strength outside of himself. 
When he was going through those seasons of life that were rough, that were tough, he didn't try to do it on his own. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, there's a story of David where he is, uh, he is in, he's in this battle mode and he's trying to conquer these nations and he's got his soldiers with him and they come into a town where his family has been and his soldiers' families had been and somebody come in and conquered him. They, they had actually captured several of the, of the children, everything of the soldiers. His own wives were captured. And he gets to this point and, and they come in 1 Samuel 30, verse six. It says, David was greatly distressed because the men... His men were talking of stoning him, killing him. Each one was very bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But here, how, how did David get through this? He found strength in the Lord his God. Things weren't going well for David. People wanted him dead, but David found strength in his God. He encouraged himself through that strength. Not his own strength, not the strength of people around him, not the situation that he was in. See, too many, too many of us are probably really good at discouraging ourselves, adding on, piling on, and struggling through things versus trying to build ourselves up through the strength of the Lord. And here, I'm telling you right now, always thinking the worst, going to that worst case scenario every time is gonna cause you to be, continue to struggle through the season of life. Where instead, we should be trying to find our strength in this, in, find our encouragement through the strength of God. Don't say life is over type of things to ourselves, even if we've missed the season. If, if at the end of our lives, we can look back and we can say, as, as Paul said, don't, you, have to, you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul said this, and that is why I suffer these things, the rough times, the, the bad seasons, but I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Dependent on God versus ourselves, right? There, be careful not to miss our season. But also be careful how you label your season because it's gonna affect how you live in your season. And then the third phrase I think we should, the third thing we should look at, this should be a life phrase I think for all of us. You've heard it, this too shall pass, right? It's gonna pass. The bad is gonna go away. The rough is gonna move on. There's a lot of societies that claim that saying in different forms and formats. It's not really found in scripture per se that, that the phrase this too shall pass, but, it's, but I think it, the idea is found in scripture. In fact, the Song of Solomon um, in, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon himself writes in Ecclesiastes 3 uh, about the seasons of life, right? It says, in everything there's a season, there's a time for every matter under heaven. There's a time to die, there's, there's time to be born, time to die, time to plant, Time to pluck what's planted. Time to break down. Time to build. Time to weep. Time to laugh. I mean, there's all these times, all these seasons. Why? Because it's going to move on. It's going to pass. There's a time for everything. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, the writer says, so whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. Right? It's going to, times are going to change. Be ready because things are going to, move, going to be moving. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, for our momentary light affliction... Is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. All the stuff that we struggle through on this earth, guys, and it, and it feels heavy. I know it does. There are seasons that just weigh us down. But if we're finding our strength and realizing that it's gonna pass, guess what? It's gonna produce for us this absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. All of us struggle with life at times. All of us struggle at times. And maybe this last year, we struggled a lot. I don't know. Maybe you look back at your last year and we walked through a life issue with a relationship. Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was a child. Maybe it was a parent. And it was, it was, it was a horrible experience. It was a tough experience. And it, and it was and probably still can be confusing to us of why we went through it. It can cause us anger. It can cause us to be depressed. It can cause us to give up. We look back at that season of life and we're like, I, I don't know how we got through it or maybe we're not even through it still. Maybe this last year was your job that caused you this. And you were frustrated. You're, you're, and, and, and you were struggling. And, and now you look into the next year and you're thinking it's not gonna get any better. And it's draining the life out of you. Maybe your spiritual life was a struggle in this last year. You haven't seen God do anything significant in your life in the last year. And so you feel like he's not near. 
Or maybe, and you, you've just been so busy with life, you put God on the back burner. Well, guess what? No matter what you've gone through in the last year, or what you're going through right now, this too shall pass. And you can get so wrapped up in whatever the issue is, we've all got the issues, we get so wrapped, in that, so wrapped up in that that we don't let God be God in the midst of our struggle. Nothing lasts forever, nothing. But that also means the good doesn't last forever, right? Because in the last year, you can look back and say, there's some great things that happened in the last year. Maybe some great things going on right now. And, and it's, it's, you know, in my life at least, it's easy for me to call out and depend on God's strength when things are not good. That's when it's good, it's easy for me to fall on God, right? But when things are really good in my life and the season is great, Sometimes I just remove God out of the picture and keep, just do my own thing. Not remembering that, hey, the good is gonna pass as well. And then I wanna get to this next situation and think, okay, God, where are you? And I'm the one that's moved away. When things are great, it can change. When things are bad, it's gonna change. Guys, this too will pass. Having God, here's the key, having God at the center of it all, no matter the season, will change everything. You gotta have God at the center of it all. Look, I don't know what your, your last year has brought to you and, and, and maybe you've been striking out, maybe you've been missing, maybe you've been whiffing a lot. But there's a great passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16, where the writer leaves us with some encouragement that I think we can take for all of us in this room moving forward in this new year because it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The new year, we're gonna have some seasons of need. And God says, hey, just approach this throne of God, approach it with confidence that I'm gonna be there for you. And you can receive mercy and you can find grace to help you in that time of need. The promises are there. God will always be there with us. That's the promises. He's gonna be there. Guys, I don't know what the last year has brought into your lives, but I know, and I don't know if you maybe you're concerned and worried about things coming up. But I do know this, having God in the middle of it all will help you not miss the season he's prepared for you. Having God in the middle of it all will not let you identify and label your season so that you see no way out. And having God, most of all, having God in the middle of it all will definitely help you look at each season knowing that it's gonna change, that it will come to pass. And as we leave this place this morning, I, man, I pray that you leave a little bit different than you came in. I pray that you, you leave challenged to remember those three things, to take those things and apply that to, that to whatever life situation you're about to be in. Guys, I wanna encourage you, the, a great way to keep God at the middle of it all is to be a part of a church family. Whether it's Stonegate or someplace else, be a, a part of a church family. Be a part of a small group. Be a part of a Bible study. Be a part of, man, take these, these, these papers that we have to help you with reading through the Bible. Do some things on purpose to put God in the middle of your life. And if God is in the center of your life, then whatever season you're gonna go through, it's gonna make sense. You're gonna be able to get through it. You're gonna find strength in him. It'll pass. You'll get through it. You'll know what's going on because God is in the middle of it all. Let me, let me pray for us this morning. Hey God, man, I love you God. Thank you so much for the challenge that this message has been in my own life while studying for this. God, I know that each one in this room, in the last year, we had so many different seasons in our life. Some we may have missed, God, a little bit. Some we may have succeeded in. Some, God, were really tough seasons of our life. Some were great seasons of our life. And yet, God, there was always times in the last year that we needed you. And sometimes we missed out on that because we moved away from you. And or we had labeled this situation in such a way that we couldn't even see you anymore. So God, I pray for those in this room as we go into this new year that we will remember, God, to keep our eyes on you and what you have in plan for us so we won't miss our season. Tell us not to miss the opportunities that you put out in front of us. But then God, to realize that even if we miss, it doesn't mean it's over. It just means then we get up, we do it again, and we make sure we keep on swinging until we continue to find what it is you have planned for our lives. And then, and then God, help us not to label. Man, not to put ourselves in a position where we make these permanent statements because of something that's just happening right now. Because you've got so many plans for us moving forward. And this situation we're in right now does not identify who we are. 
does not identify who we are as a person, who we are as a family, who we are as whatever that looks like, God, as a relationship with you, help us not to identify that. And then God, help us just to, to keep the promise and keep the faith and it's gonna pass. This too will pass. And that you're in the middle of it all. God, help us to all practice putting you in the middle so that, that God, you can teach us some amazing things in the next year to come. Thank you, Lord, for being with us this morning. Thank you for the chance we got to worship together and spend time. And thank you for the holidays we got to celebrate and this new year coming up. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In your name we pray, amen. Guys, I hope you guys have a great new year. Um, we're gonna have some people up front that you can pray with if you'd like to come pray. And guys, we'll see you next year, right? Happy new year to you guys.